I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're tuned in to The Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today my guest is Rachel Godfrey, fitness model, physiotherapist and mind and body coach. Now Rachel works with her husband to help women to supercharge their emotional intelligence and happiness in body and business. Get yourself a coach and a leader, you know, somebody who's been there, who can not just hold your hand, but who could basically put their hand out and then drag you through every single one of those loopholes and those blind spots that you're inevitably going to have because we can see it coming before you do. Watch this interview as we discuss what the key is to long lasting weight loss and it's not what you think. Honestly, the magic pill is your relationship with yourself. Rachel, do you want to tell my audience where you are? Well, I'm currently sat in Abu Dhabi, um, but as we were just talking off air, I have also lived in London in the same area that you've lived in. So we've got, I think we've got quite a fair bit in common. And Rachel, I was just saying that I've been following you and you've been a great inspiration of mine for a number of years now. But could you tell my audience um, who you are and what you do now? Well, <laughs> I have like several versions of this depending on, you know, how long we've got. So I'll just give you the kind of like shorter version for now. Um, so basically, uh, my love has always been in sport and health and fitness. And I think growing up, I was always very conditioned into education and, you know, making sure that you have like a good career in inverted commas. So I went down the route of um, going to medical school and I studied physio. Um, and then I worked for the NHS for nearly two years. Um, and I hated it. I hated every minute of it. And I don't think it was necessarily the job. I just didn't particularly like myself at that time. And so I drove myself to work harder because I, I guess that sense of achievement was uh, very personally fulfilling for me especially when you're struggling with low self-worth you sometimes look for things on the outside to make yourself feel better so for me that came from a lot of work overachieving whether it be in sport whether it be academically etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, that I guess workaholic nature in me took me then down to Australia and uh, I did my postgrad studies down there and became a personal trainer, which was um, in many people's eyes, a bit of a backtrack. And so many people, I, I, fa I was faced with so much, why are you, like, are you serious? Like you've just spent years at university, like why do you just wanna be just a personal trainer? And that, it kind of gave me that energy of well, I'm gonna show you anyway. So I knew at that stage I was completely unemployable. I think one of the reasons why I despised um, physios so much was the fact that I had to be in work at a, at a certain time, somebody was gonna tell me how much I was going to earn and at what time of day I was going to leave. Now, anybody who knows me knows that <laughs> that is not me <laughs> and I, do not like conforming to set rules and I'm sure you're nodding your head there I know, I'm nodding my head because I've, I've listened to you and I believe you're um you're from where, a South Wales girls is that right or part of Bill and Brad yes <laughs> and, and, and feisty along with it which is what I love yes there's definitely an element of that and so I think and actually you know that that very masculine feisty trait certainly helped me a lot along the way and I you know we see this now with a lot of clients that we work with who work in um in banking in law in finance that are very masculine energy which is great because you know it certainly helps you get a certain way but you've got to balance that out with the feminine energy because the feminine the, a strong feminine energy is very very powerful but I saw that as a weakness. And so um, I built my career upon, be, you know, I guess in a male dominated industry, being quite aggressive, being very outspoken. Um, and yeah, having that Welsh aggression with me along the way. So that's basically brought me to what I do now. I, I specialize in female fat loss and also a body and life upgrade, because I'm sure we'll talk about this later, because Fat loss is an emotional problem. It's not just about exercise more, eat a little bit less, and you're going to lose weight. Well, that's great, okay? We can't deny the science. We can't deny the law of thermodynamics, which is you need to eat less calories. But why can't people do it? 
and it's because fat loss is an emotional problem. So this is essentially where my husband, David and I work now is helping women upgrade their life and improve their relationship with themselves. So they therefore improve their relationship with their body, their relationship with food and their relationship with the future and the past and the present. So it's all of these relationships intertwined, which in a nutshell, yes, I am a fat loss coach and I specialize in female fat loss, but it's about becoming a better version of yourself in order to be able to get that. So that's the um, the short elevator pitch. <laughs> I, I love that, Rachel. There's so much there that, that I want to pick up on. I love the, the fact that you recognize the masculine energy. Um, I, I know, you know, being, I, I was in corporate life for 15 years in the banking sector, um, and I, I developed that aggression as well and was, was very driven and determined. And actually, it wasn't until I came out that I just had to discover a completely new side to me, or actually, I had to bring out that feminine side to me because I realized that I'd really honed in on my masculine aggression being around men all day. But before we get to that and before we get down to sort of um, how you help, help women today, what I'd love to, if we, if we go back into your journey, what were your biggest challenges um, in terms of your fitness journey and how you, you maybe perceived your own body? I think uh, going right back to the beginning of my fitness journey, I've always been into sport and I've always been a very physically active child. Um, when I was 13, I dislocated my shoulder and I was taken to a surgeon and the surgeon took one look at me and he said, Rachel, he said, you're like a floppy rag doll. I cannot operate on you. I had multi-directional instability in both of my shoulders. I'm hypermobile. My arms extend backwards. My knees extend backwards, et cetera, et cetera. But um, he sent me to a physio and that really set me up on my journey and my love for lifting weights. So my dad took me to the gym and we, I started working out with weights. Of course, I just copied whatever the guy next to me was doing, right? I had no idea what I was doing. But from there, the love comes. And I went to, with my dad to training. And so we went to his personal trainer and I didn't, I wasn't necessarily lifting weights at that stage, but I was certainly doing things like pushing a prowler, um, you know, you know, throwing medicine balls, things that children can actually do, which is great resistance training for a kid. I started boxing. I started basically just to strengthen my body. Um, and there, from there, that's when I obviously grew into, you usually go down the aerobics road, road right? As a, as a young girl. So at 16, I did aerobics and the spinning because it's not intimidating and it's what every woman does. But then I realized very quickly, that's not what was going to change my body. And um, I happened to be at a gym one day. I was probably... 17 uh, this is before I went to university and um I had a I then went along with this guy and he was a Polish bodybuilder <laughs> so as you can imagine I learned the basics um you know eating your chicken and broccoli and eating your sweet potato um and things like that from him and so I learned to lift with him really and so I then took that all through um university and that's where weight training just became then part of my daily life what struggles have I had? Um, you know, one of the struggles that came to mind was trying to balance weight training and rugby training because talking about masculine energy, right? I was at university and I played rugby. Um, <laughs> not something quite unusual for, you know, you're a very feminine lady, very beautiful lady. It doesn't sort of, the two don't seem to go together. Yeah. I know, and it's that classic thing of don't judge a book by its cover, right? But anyway, I happened to fall into playing rugby at university, which I loved. Um, God, I used to get so sore um, after playing rugby. And, you know, the, the difference in soreness between lifting weights and then, you know, you have to learn to run and you have to learn very fast because your life freaking depends upon it. Um, yeah, I just remember trying to get up and down off the toilet seat at university and my legs from rugby training were so sore. Um, so, you know, in terms of struggles with my body, it, it, for me, it's been more of a physical thing, managing injuries, managing hypermobility. I've never had um, like body issues. You know, I think we all go through that phase if in your teens, you, you want to be skinnier, but it never really affected me to the point of 
I would focus on it. You know, it, I was, um, I've had really bad IBS since I was 11 or 12. So I think, you know, if I was going to say that I had a fear of food, it would have been because I knew certain foods would make my tummy really bad and it, I would feel ill after eating certain foods. But for me, definitely uh, my struggles were in performance. So if I didn't perform well in sport, if I wasn't achieving in work, if I wasn't achieving my academic grades, that really knocked my self-worth. So whilst a lot of women really struggle with self-worth around their body and how they feel, I've never been overweight, um, but I have really struggled in other areas of my life, such as my self-worth being wrapped up in all of these other things. So, you know, it just manifests in different ways for a lot of women. Yes, it comes down to their body and how they feel about themselves because of the way that they look. For other women, it can be the external stuff of, you know, how much money they're making or, you know, how many houses they own or how many, so, you know, what their salary is, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think the biggest obstacle today is for women and, and, and men losing weight? What, what obstacles do they face? Oh, I think that's a million dollar question, right? I think that the, the big obvious one for me, and I think because, because of the work that David and I do, it's pretty obvious and that's that fat loss is an emotional problem. And I think what we're seeing today on, you know, a lot on social media, and I say social media because the, the magazines aren't here anymore. You know, there's a lot of magazines that, out, that have gone out of print, but we used to see it in magazines. We're seeing it now more so on social media is completely uneducated people, often young people who are in fairly good shape, um, probably, you know, early genetics. You can get away with a lot when you're in your 20s spouting absolute bullshit information and even if they are you know putting out good information there's there's like these two camps now on social media you know you've got the um go hard and you know go and train category and giving out all sorts of funny information there and then on the other side we've got the anti-diet culture category where we're actually glamorizing obesity and this is also a problem. Now, you know, when we've got the side here where we've got women who are saying, oh, here's what you see on Instagram, but the, you know, influencers in inverted commas like this now where they're posting a, you know, a flattering image of themselves and then they're posting a, a second image, you know, side by side where, well, this is actually what I look like in real life. Now to the trained eye, it's very obvious. You, I'm sorry, honey, but you actually look the same in both photos, but, We've, we've got to kind of get away from both of these. Like the, I get the anti-diet culture idea is you need to learn to love yourself the way that you are right now. That's great. I fully subscribe to that. And you do have to learn to love and accept you are exclusively and wholly as you are right now today. But you can be really excited about the journey, about who you are, what you stand for and where you're going in life and the transformation that your body is about to undergo. So you can be in both camps. So you don't need to be extreme over here and you don't need to be the anti-diet culture, but you can, be in the, you can be in the middle and just have fun with it as well. I think a lot of women today are, um, feel hopeless and they very much take on a victim mindset of, oh, but it's all too hard for me. Now, yes, women today do have it tough. We have got a lot of responsibility. We are in charge of childcare. We are in charge of often also bringing in, you know, um, income to the family, we're in charge of the house, we're in charge of the cooking, the cleaning, etc, et everything. But you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first. And that doesn't mean that you need to go and train, you know, for two hours, five days a week. But it does mean that you've got to make some space and some time for yourself. Like I'm sure every single client I've, I've asked, and I've said, you know, you know, when, where can we fit this into your diary? Oh, I don't have time. I'm too busy, et cetera, et cetera. I let it go five minutes and I'll say, oh, did you see the latest, you know, whatever the latest Netflix thing is, or, you know, something to do with Kardashians or something, whatever is in vogue at the time. And they'll be able to tell you everything about that. And I'm like, okay, so let's backtrack a minute. When you said that you didn't have time, let's just say that you're just choosing not to spend your time in certain areas of your life. And then I think there, from there, we have to learn to take extreme and full ownership and personal leadership for ourselves. That is where, fat loss being an emotional problem comes from is first of all we've got to learn to take full and exclusive ownership of where we are right now today that's not blaming and shaming ourselves or what's happened or anybody else 
It's taking a long, hard look at where you are right now today, and then looking at what you can do, minimal effective dose to put into your plan to move you forward. And consistency every single day, doing something small every single day is what leads to that result in six months to a year's time where somebody meets you and says, not just, oh, you look really good. Oh my God, you look amazing. Like you're just, your vibe is amazing. Your God, you just got this sex appeal about you. You look so good. What the hell have you been doing? And all it is, is just these small little things along the way. Rachel, I mean, you, you touched on a lot of things there. One thing that I got is, you know, the modern women have so many different things to juggle. Um, how do you juggle? Because, you know, you, you've got two, two children, um, a, an amazing business, and you look absolutely fabulous. How do you juggle all of those things personally? Um, well, I guess I'll start with the fitness first because a lot of people think that I spend a lot of time exercising. And in fact, it's actually quite the opposite. I lift consistently three times a week for 45 minutes. Um, you know, we've wow. just been in Spain. We've just been in Spain for the summer and I was only lifting twice a week over there because I didn't have the, the support structure that I have here at home um, that I've basically had to create. So three times a week of 45 minutes, it's not, it's not long. And some people can't even get that. Now, one thing that I'll say to people always is it really depends on your phase of life. So I have a three-year-old and a, um, a one-year-old and my time right now is very precious. I have two very young children. Xavier is just about to start um, kindy. Emily is not going to start kindergarten for another, um, yeah, another year. So, you know, my time right now is very caught up. That of course is a choice and I'm choosing to spend a lot more time with my children than I would perhaps in the business. So I, um, David is in the office all the hours right now and I do kind of part-time hours with the business. Um, is it frustrating at times? Of course it is because I'm torn, but then you have to go back to your values of, okay, so what do you value the most? Do you value like making tons of money or do you value spending time with your children right now? But scheduling is really important. So everybody knows their role of, you know, when I do certain things, when I'm working, um, then, you know, obviously the children, obviously Xavi was at nursery or school, Emily's with, with her nanny. Um, and then, you know, I'm always home at lunchtime. So scheduling is definitely um, a big one. So that's how I do it. It's a, through a really good support structure. Um, and, you know, a lot of children go to nursery and go to school um, very young. I've chosen to keep mine at home because I have that ability here living in the UAE um but otherwise I think sometimes I've just got to wing it <laughs> to be honest I just wing a lot you know and and have you found since I mean look, I've, I've seen I've seen pictures uh, of you and uh, on holiday etc and I'm like wow you just had two babies and your body you, you look amazing and I'm sure a lot of your clients see this I mean do you struggle now more with it than, than you used to um, and, and if so, what sort of things do you sort of think, well, I can keep, these are the things that are my bare minimum and these are the things I can sort of let go of a little bit of. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, let's be honest here, yeah, I've been lifting since I was 13 years old. So, you know, if I train three days a week now, um, I've got a lot of experience. And so I know how to maximize those training sessions, you know, so I, I, we can't negate the work that I've put in in order to be able to to do what I do now. I think that's um, so important. I mean, I I, I picked up. I, mean, uh, I picked up. I, I dropped the pink dumped up bells. Let's put it that way, and 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 started lifting properly only in my sort of mid forties. Um, and I look back and I think, God, I wish I had picked this up earlier. You know, I'm glad I've done it now and I'll continue to do it. But absolutely, um, and that's the one thing I, I, I sort of tell all women, you know, um, I'm, I'm not going to not cardio. Well, maybe I am a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> just pick up some weights. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But yes, hands off to you for doing it since you're 13. That, that's amazing. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, so obviously, like, you know, you pay you you pay your dues every single day and so you know those years and years of paying my dues daily have allowed me to do what I do now that doesn't mean exactly as you said that doesn't mean you know that puts some people in the mindset of oh well, what's the point you know I'm 35 now I'm 40 what's what's the point like I'm never gonna look like that rubbish you can I mean gosh 
the amount of women, in fact, I would say, I, in fact, I'm going to go on record for saying this, I have had more body transformations in women over the age of 35, better and more sustainable transformations over the age of 35 after they've had children than I had with girls in their 20s. I'm going to go on record for saying that. Yeah, well, so, that's amazing. I personally think it's the age of the older woman having just turned 50. So rock, rock, the older woman. I that's you. all I can say. <laughs> By the way, for everybody listening, I just fell off my chair earlier when Sonia told me that she was 50. I was like, oh my gosh, you look amazing like amazing you've just got this vibe about you that's thank just you, so thank you, thank you and I do owe part of, a, a lot of that to, to to my lifestyle I'm very blessed to have the lifestyle I do um and and I fit I fit training in and it's a different type of training to the training yeah. I did in my 30s certainly mm. Mm. so you know so, sorry I, I interrupted Rachel but but going back to Okay, you talked about your training in terms of, of your uh, of your diet, which I think in itself is a contentious word, but diet for me is just what we choose to eat on a regular basis as opposed to putting ourselves through, through some sort of weird starvation program. Do, is there anything you deny yourself? What, what does your typical sort of diet look like? Um, I don't deny myself anything. I mean, I think the, the second that you say you can't have something, it's just like, well, then I'm all over it. You know, I limit the amount of wine that I drink. I mean, I love red wine. If I was to ask my soul what it was going to be doing every day, I'd be like, oh, well, we'll start red wine at 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be joining you. <laughs> exactly. It's 5 p.m. somewhere in the world, right? So yeah. I love, I love red, I love red wine. I love cheese. I love bread. I love ice cream. I love all of the stuff that we all love. But I think, of course, you know, you've got to choose foods. I mean, if you're going to eat a diet of red wine, cheese, ice cream and bread, honestly, you're going to be feeling pretty shit over the first couple of days. So, you know, you then choose foods that make you feel good. So um, I, I actually have a low FODMAP diet. Now I have chronic IBS that I manage still to this day, um, which I manage through um, good nutrition so I don't eat things like onion and garlic, which does present with quite a few problems when I eat out at restaurants. Um, but so be it, you know, I've, I've done it for so long now. I just say no onion and garlic in that dish. And it's often, you know, most restaurants never have a problem with it. It's quite an odd al uh, allergy or an intolerance to have. So a lot of restaurants are quite mindful. Um, although, you know, sometimes it can sneak in now and again. And how did you get um, to find out th these were your intolerances? I know you mentioned FODMAP. Can you just explain a little bit more for, for people that don't understand what that is? So um, FODMAPs are certain foods which can basically ferment in different ways in your gut. So onion and garlic can, uh, for me, uh, you know, two of the FODMAPs, there's like hundreds and hundreds of them. If you're interested in learning more, um, there's a really good app called the Monash Low FODMAP app, I think it's called. I'll have to check on my phone afterwards. Um, but that's really good. And it's, it's, it's awesome for when you're learning what foods you're intolerant to is basically just checking everything on it's like a traffic light system so um a lot of women who struggle with bloating first of all garlic um first of all dairy and gluten out of the diet those are the first two to go if you're struggling with bloating um then i would definitely start on a low fodmap diet so checking all of the foods that you eat so you all you need to do is basically go to the search bar and type in the food that you're about to eat so let's just say i don't know onion let's just take onion for example and then it will basically give you a traffic light system so a little bit of you know the food might be green you know if you have a cup of it it might then turn orange and then if you're having like two cups of it excuse me it might turn red so then you'll know whether that food is going to be appropriate for you to eat or not now um I did this all through basically trial and error and I was advised to start a low FODMAP diet by a professor gastroenterologist. His name's Professor Warwell and he practices out of uh, Manchester. I was living in Sydney at the time when I flew to Manchester to see him wow. and he changed my life. And so if you are struggling with IBS, he is the go-to guy. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he retires soon. He's been in, in the game a very long time, but he is probably one of the most passionate and compassionate doctors that I have met in the field of IBS. Wow, amazing. And, and now you, I mean, are you somebody that eats three meals a day, protein with every meal? Um, 
yeah, I do have a high protein diet. So generally I have four meals a day. Um, sometimes I can only fit in three, which is fine. Um, and I go by hunger, energy and cravings. So um, I'll always look at my plate and think, where is the protein? So my proteins obviously come from meat, fish, um, you know, whatever it might be that I'm eating at the time. Uh, and then obviously with the vegetables, because I have IBS, I don't have a huge amount of vegetables in my diet. I have a lot compared to the average person, but I don't have a huge amount. And the vegetables that I do have um, are a little bit more limited to somebody who doesn't struggle with IBS. So I have, I love lots of color on the plate. And I think one of the things that as women were taught, we can't eat carrots and we can't eat potato and we can't eat other colorful foods like beetroot, rubbish, get lots of color on your plate. Don't just eat the green stuff. The green stuff is amazing, but eat lots of color. And that's, that's really important. And then, um, you know, I have a pretty balanced diet, I eat like lots of rice and potato and, you know, all the white rice and white potato and all of the things that actually experts in inverted commas tell you not to eat on a fat loss plan. I, 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 eat I, I was just about to ask about the carbohydrates um, because that's had a bit of a, a bad knock over uh, the past few years. So where, where, where does your view stand on that if you were to advise anyone? Um, no, my general to lose weight should they cut yeah. out carbs so my general advice for somebody who is looking to lose weight don't completely cut out your carbs you're doing yourself a complete disservice because we need carbohydrates to train and we need carbohydrates to fit to, to satisfy our hunger energy and cravings if you cut all of those out then of course you're going to be binging you know two hours later um so you know there are times where i will reduce the amount of carbs in somebody's diet um, but it's still not considered a low carb diet um, I would much prefer to see a slightly slower result but a sustainable result and somebody have a very good and healthy relationship with food along the way so my general guideline is if you're eating four meals a day then I like to see carbs in your post training meal and I like to see carbs at night as well because they help you sleep so that's that's my general guideline. So definitely two pour two two serves of carbs a day, and a serve would be one cooked cup of rice, as an example. I love this because people still say to me, um, "Well, of course I'm not having any carbs after six o'clock." You know, I'm I'm good. I don't eat carbs after six. I'm like, do you think the carbs know that? Do you think your body knows what time? I mean, it, it, it's you know, it, it, it just makes me laugh that people uh, you know have, have, be, have been brought into this and i know i shouldn't i shouldn't diss that because you know we're all fed mass medium all, all fed all sorts of different uh things i mean i still go home and and my mum and my, my dad can't believe that i have full fat butter and more than three eggs a week you know i, I have eggs on a regular basis and they still go on about cholesterol levels so um but yes i think the carbs after a certain time was one of one of the funniest things yes that's either i mean your body's very smart to know like that you know 559 you can get those carbs in but like 601 forget it but um you know and, and again going back to exactly what you were saying about full fat butter eating whole natural foods that is so important is that it's not yes we need to be in a calorie deficit to lose weight yes we do but how do we achieve that in a manner that satisfies our hunger energy and cravings you know i see a lot in the fitness industry now you know especially back in that camp of you know fitness influencers and their you know their extreme ways of doing things you know having like shitty fitnessy food as i call it like you know pro um greek yogurt low fat of course high protein and then adding whey protein into it i mean it, it tastes rubbish it tastes awful like when you when you're well fed and you eat good food that snack tastes rubbish and you're going to be hungry an hour later. So if you're going to eat something like that for, with 300 calories or whatever it is, you may as well just have like a proper meal. You know, I, have some I, I've got to admit that was one of my favorite things when I was on the prep. Um, yeah. that was the, it was like, oh, get your protein in, but have something that was nice and sweet as well with it. It was like, it felt like a treat because um, I used to mix it with one of my favorite tasting whey protein powders. And yeah, I did exact. I used to do exactly that. You're right. I, I always say, like, I always know when somebody has been dieting for a long time and they don't have much variation in their diet when they really like rice cakes, 
because rice cakes are frankly like cardboard unless you're going to put a big slab of like brie on it that's yeah. a whole time of it yeah yeah a big slab of butter on it and then it's you know it's all right then but um, you know if you're going to eat rice cakes like i know when somebody like I know when somebody's pushed themselves too far and it, they like, it's the, it's about the texture. And so we have to really get good at cooking and the texture of food is really important as part of a fat loss plan. You know, I think a lot of us just eat like dry chicken breast, cold broccoli with a couple of almonds. And what, right, well, there's your macronutrients. You know, you've got your veggies, you've got your protein and you've got your fat. It tastes like rubbish. So we have to, you know, how do we make that kind of meal a little bit more tasty? So one of my best friends, Manar, she's an amazing cook. Um, uh, if you follow her on social, she's Manar Eats. She has basically, um, she teaches how to create tasty, normal food. Um, so, you know, some of the things that uh, David and I do, we'll poach chicken breasts in coconut milk, for example. And that's a really tasty meal. Then it's nice and warm. I do subscribe then to the, the very um, Eastern uh, philosophies around Chinese medicine about eating warm meals because I think a lot of women yeah. are just eat on the go and eating cold meals all the time well that doesn't help your vibe yeah <laughs> and, and I agree a lot of people say I'll oh, just have a salad and that's like well uh, firstly we live in a cold country I mean you know okay we might be having a little bit of a heat wave at the moment but it's normally <laughs> pretty cold uh, so you want something hot and nutritious definitely I don't, I don't think salad's always a rocket for me either Quite definitely good. and I, I think that's a really under underestimated thing for sure what three things um if you were to name three and it's quite quite hard to do would you advise a woman that wants to start losing weight but she's struggling to know where to start and she's maybe gone through a few fad diets and they haven't worked um oh, I know this is the million dollar question <laughs> isn't it <laughs> Are you the magic pill where is it give me it. honestly the magic pill is your relationship with yourself and so if you can love and accept yourself as who you are right now today and show up as who you really are not who you think that you should be in every aspect of your life learn about personal growth and personal leadership, take extreme ownership of where you are right now. No blame, shame, or judgment, just is what it is. Um, that is really important. The second thing would definitely be, once you've done that and you've made the decision to immerse yourself in that, get yourself a coach and a leader, You know, somebody who's been there, who can not just hold your hand, but who could basically put their hand out and then drag you through every single one of those loopholes and those blind spots that you're inevitably going to have because we can see it coming before you do. So, you know, I know that, you know, we've got to say, for example, I've got a client and she's on a roll with her fat loss or whatever. I know that she's a couple of days, if not a week away from a plateau of some description or something. I can see it coming. And I think that, that intuition comes from experience. And so once you've got somebody like that by your side, it makes the journey so much easier. Um, and I guess the third thing is having belief in yourself and just backing yourself and having that tenacity and that relentlessness because let me tell you it's going to take longer than you think it's going to take it's going to be harder than you think it's going to be it's going to cost more money than you think it's going to cost everything so as long as you're prepared for that and you've made that ultimate decision of I am I can and I will no matter what then you keep going you just got to keep just keep that resilience and keeping that tenacity over and over and with the two above loving and accepting yourself as who you really are, learning about emotional fitness and state management, having somebody to help you along the way, so investing in a coach, and then that third one of the decision to keep going, that is the winning combo. Rachel, I absolutely love that, and I could talk to you all day, but I, I, I feel like when this, that, what you just said, those three things, um, because they're not the obvious things, you know, I'm sure people were, you were gonna say, eat more protein, diet more, uh, exercise more, this, that, the other. But you've nailed it. You've absolutely nailed it. Rachel, if people want to find out more about yours and David's program, how do they go about doing that? And I will put this in the show notes as well. Amazing. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me on the show. I really enjoyed this chat. And yes, we could continue this chat for a long time. Maybe next time we should do it over a bottle of wine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, when you're next in London... <laughs> 
Absolutely, definitely. So if you want to find out more about what we do, um, first of all, um, I'm at Athletic Fox on Instagram and David is at DX Godfrey. David tends to post the more um, serious clinical type stuff and I take I post more the fun stuff, uh, a lot more of the exercise stuff. And But our worlds definitely combined and we can't do one without the other. Um, and then our website is chaselifeconsulting.com. And we have also just recently launched a group program as well, which is basically an inner circle to help high value women and high achieving women just improve their body and their life together. And that's called Chase XQ. So we've got some trainings coming up on that as well. Rachel, I'm out to my final question. And, and that is, if you were to write a message in a bottle for future generations to find, what would the message be? Oh, now I wish you'd prep me for this. <laughs> Sorry, that is mean. <laughs> hey, no, I know what it is. I know what it is because I just like, if I always do this, if I tune in and I, it's the first thing that comes to me, it's, it always works out. I love it. Rachel, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. Thank you so much for having me. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like and you'll get it straight into your inbox.